Episode 27 of the Laurel and Hardy podcast is dedicated to the memory of film historian Dave Wyatt, who sadly and unexpectedly passed away at the beginning of October 2022. In the picture parade that caused peals of laughter to ring out of every movie theater in the land was Laurel and Hardy's Wrong Again, written and directed by Leo McCary. Stan and Oliver arrive with the equine blue boy. Paddle, who in the way of the eccentric rich, is taking his Saturday night bath on Monday afternoon, throws down the key. You mean in the house? asks Hardy. Expecting his painting, Paddle says yes, never dreaming that this blue boy has four hooves and a tail and may not be housebroken. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 27 of the Laurel and Hardy podcast, the newly rebranded Laurel and Hardy podcast. It's a simple change, same show, new name. So it's no longer the blogcast, it's now podcast. Not blog. Hard 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 On today's show, we are taking our deep dive into the next film Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy made together, and that is the silent short Wrong Again, filmed in November 1928 and which became their second release of 1929. Uh, But first, I want to just share uh, one of the emails that I received this past month. Um, This one comes from Anna Di Pangrecio. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it, Anna. Apologies if it's not. Um, And Anna says, congratulations on your great podcast series. I discovered it on Spotify some weeks ago. Uh, It's clear that there is a great effort behind it and good podcasts take a lot of work. So kudos. Very entertaining and informative. The diverse invited guests are great as well. All the best in the upcoming episodes. Kind regards from a Buster Keaton and Stan Laurel fan. And Anna is from Buenos Aires in Argentina. So thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for taking the time to get in touch. And in another little bit of news, um, I was honoured to be asked to introduce the boys in habeas corpus at a Halloween Laurel and Hardy film Triple Bill as part of the Birmingham Comedy Festival at the end of October. Um, It was wonderful to see and be part of a packed room full of people of all ages. Um, We were all laughing along to some classic Laurel and Hardy shorts uh, that also included the live ghost and the Laurel Hardy murder case. Uh, So thank you to John and everyone associated with the event. It was a real, real treat. Um, I, of course, took the opportunity to ring the bell for the boys' silent shorts um, whilst I was there. And yet again, there was a lot of interest and excitement for my upcoming book, Laurel and Hardy Silence. Um, uh, Now, many of you have also been in touch uh, this last month to say how much you enjoyed the first issue of the all-new Laurel and Hardy magazine. Uh, Russell and I have been really pleased with the feedback and and suggestions, and we've taken many of the comments on board. Uh, We will be making one or two tweaks, uh, but generally issue one, we think, was a great success. Issue two is due out in January, February 2023, uh, and we'll focus on the boys' third talkie, Men of War. Um, And we've got a fabulous exclusive article by Richard Bann, uh, also one, I think, by Glenn Mitchell, to name but two. Um, So if you haven't subscribed just yet, don't leave it too long. Um, Just visit laurelandhardymag.com, and we do ship the magazine worldwide, so you don't have to worry about getting hold of your copy if you live in Buenos Aires, Anna. (laughs) Um, And speaking of Glenn Mitchell, Glenn is today's special guest on the podcast um, and he's going to be helping me to get a white horse onto a piano very shortly. But before that, we will begin with today's audio blog. Today's film in focus is Wrong Again. It was filmed November 21st to December 1st, 1928 and it was released on February the 23rd, 1929. Uh, It was a two-reeler produced by Hal Roach, directed by Leo McCary, photographed by George Stevens. Although it took a while for Hal Roach to decide how to react to the arrival of the talkies, once his mind was made up, he wasted no time converting his entire operation. The experience gained from producing the handful of synchronised shorts in the autumn of 1928 across all the main Roach series was enough to give the producer the confidence to go all in. Throughout October 1928, several trade papers reported on the partnership that would deliver the Hal Roach Studios into cinema's new age. Quote, Roach and Victor Studios hook up. By the terms of contracts just signed between Hal Roach and the Victor Talking Machine Company, 
the Hal Roach Studios in Culver City, California, will be allied for many years to come with the reproducing facilities of the Victor organisation. This means that the public will hear the Our Gang Kids, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, Charlie Chase and other Hal Roach stars in talking pictures. Victor technicians are en route to Mr Roach's studios and the enlarging of this motion picture plant, which was begun some time ago, will be rushed to completion. The Roach Studios are the only ones whose sound production is operated by Victor. In making the announcement of his contract yesterday, Mr Roach said that the combined efforts of the Victor Company and Hal Roach Studios can produce a new type of entertainment that will be happily received by exhibitors and the motion picture field at large. And that was in the Exhibitor's Daily Review, October 8th, 1928. Just as publicly optimistic about the fruitfulness of the new venture was W.E. Shoemaker, president of the Victor Company. Quote, The art and technique of Victor's sound recording laboratories will be added to the skill and creative ability displayed in the productions of the Hal Roach Studios as a result of a contract just executed. It is a pleasure to announce this further step in the progress being made to bring the technique and experience of our organisation, resulting from years of activity in the business of recording and reproducing sound, to the side of the art of recording and reproducing action by photography. Anticipating the completion of negotiations, several members of the Roach organisation are already in Camden, conferring with the Victor staff, and Victor engineers are en route to study requirements on the coast. And that was in Motion Picture News, October 13th, 1928. In previous interviews on the subject of the talkies, Roach had been uncharacteristically hesitant about the future. However, two months into a trip to New York to finalise his deal with Victor, the producer was beginning to regain his usual bullish confidence. Hal Roach spoke to reporters in New York before returning home to California. Quote, I look forward to a very interesting season of talking and sound comedies from our studios for two reasons. One is the minuteness of detail with which the Victor Company is going about this special cooperation with us. And the second reason is traceable to the fact that practically all the players under contract to me have had previous stage experience. Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy and Charlie Chase, in their experimental tests for spoken humour, have lived up to the expectations which their previous stage experience warranted. As for the gang, the success of their recent nationwide tour of the leading motion picture houses of the country has proved their stage presence and their ability to amuse the public, not only with their antics, but through the spoken word. And as we have built a definite reputation for quality in silent pictures, we intend to have that same quality extended in our sound pictures. And that was in the Exhibitors Herald and Moving Picture World, October 13th, 1928. A month later, back in Culver City, Roach was brimming with even more optimism about the opportunities that the new world of sound recording would bring. Quote, The talking picture opens up a new and lucrative field for the world's greatest musicians, and naturally to them, the answer is Hollywood. My own arrangement with the Victor people requiring, as it will, the services at the studio of their tremendous galaxy of musical talent I feel will assist somewhat in helping this happy situation. Equipment is en route west and will be completely installed by December 15th, by which time the first contingent of Victor artists will also have arrived to participate in our extensive sound programme. Probably our first production will be in the form of a musical comedy starring Harry Langdon, whose services we have recently acquired, surrounding him with the cast of Victor artists and singing beauty chorus, which we believe will shatter all precedent. And that was in the Los Angeles Evening Express, November 17th, 1928. Several trade publications, including Motion Picture News, confirmed Roach's comments about Harry Langdon's contract to appear in feature-length musical comedies for the studio. However, by mid-December, further reports appeared confirming that the deal had been cancelled. Langdon eventually landed a series of short comedies at Roach, beginning in June 1929 and ending with the release of the final short in June 1930. As the Victor trucks, laden with sound recording equipment, trundle steadily westward, heading for the Culver City, the production units on the lot of fun settle back to business as usual. For the Laurel and Hardy unit, following the thrills of liberty was always going to be a tall order, with its dramatic location and hair-raising action. 
However, Leo McCary in the director's chair for the third time in a row pulled it off with some style. Filmed at the end of November 1928, Wrong Again was the boy's second release of 1929. The Laurel and Hardy comedies were growing in popularity, and Stan and Babe were enjoying the most successful time of their careers to date. However, away from the studio, the boys' personal lives were quite contrasting. Ollie's marriage with Myrtle had continued to become ever more strained due to her ongoing problems with alcohol. Babe hated seeing his wife this way and consequently began spending more and more time away from the marital home, choosing to spend his time and money at the racetrack, gambling on the horses or pursuing his favourite pastime of golf. In just a few months, Myrtle would file for divorce. Conversely, for Stan, this was a seemingly golden period. He had recently moved into a new colonial-style home at 718 North Bedford Drive, Beverly Hills with his wife Lois and their one-year-old daughter, also named Lois. Increasing their family dynamic further and following Stan's belief that every child should have a dog, they adopted a beautiful St Bernard named Lady. Lady often accompanied Stan to work and even appeared in several official publicity stills. As different as their private lives may have been at this point in time, they both left any troubles at the studio gate. Their workplace became both their refuge and their playground. On November 21st, 1928, Stan and Babe began filming Wrong Again. The film became one of director Leo McCary's big favourites of all the Laurel and Hardy films, and he also claimed responsibility for the story idea. Quote, I had my tonsils removed, and I was unable to go to the studio. I couldn't talk, so I was sitting in the living room, and we had a large facsimile of Gainsborough's Blue Boy hanging there. I'm sitting in front of it, trying to get an idea for Laurel and Hardy... Well, the phone rang, and it was the studio. They said, The gang is sitting around here, and they've come up with nothing. And Stan suggested we call you and see if you've got anything. So I started ad-libbing. I said, Yes, I've got an idea. It opens on a millionaire who owns this painting, Gainsborough's Blue Boy. It's stolen, and he offers a handsome reward. And there's a big article in the paper. We cut to the racetrack, and Laurel and Hardy are two race touts reading this article. They remark about the sizable reward and say how they can use it. Just then, a horse goes by and on its blanket it says, Blue Boy. So they look at each other and give a nod. And the next thing you know, here comes those two fellows up to the millionaire's home with a horse. This is just ad-libbing. Well, they take the horse up to the door and it's covered by a portico. And the millionaire sticks his head out of the upstairs window. He was taking a shower. They say, they've got Blue Boy and he's overjoyed. He says... Bring it in, and he throws the key down. He says, I keep it in the living room. Then there's some byplay about millionaires being eccentric. He's got all kinds of money, and it's his house, and it's his horse, and he could do what he wants about it. All they want is the reward. So, with a shrug of the shoulders, they take the horse into the house. End quote. With only a few tweaks, the plot line that McCary recounted was pretty much exactly how the comedy ultimately played out. Rather than playing the roles of two race touts, though, at the racetrack, Stan and Ollie are stable hands, and we first meet them mucking out one of the stables. Rather than creating a set on the back lot, the crew went out on location to the Uplifters Club sports complex in Santa Monica. The gags come thick and fast from the outset of the picture, and first we see Ollie showering a well-dressed gent with dirty hay from the floor of the horse's stable. He acts very coy and embarrassed when he discovers his mistake with wonderful childlike innocence. The boys quickly get into a great bit of business with a bucket that Stan is trying to fill up with water from a hose pipe, but he only succeeds in firing water up his own backside. Ollie grabs the bucket and takes over, only to discover the bucket has no bottom. He throws the useless item across the stable yard in a fit of pique. The flying bucket duly hits a small carriage and knocks its wheel off, almost dislodging the occupant. It's a delightfully funny slapstick start to the film. As per McCary's version, Stan and Ollie mistakenly think that they've discovered the stolen Blue Boy. But rather than the stolen painting, their Blue Boy is the racehorse, whose stable they just mucked out. They confidently arrive at the millionaire's residence, expecting to collect a sizable reward. The property used for the exterior scenes of the mansion was built in 1913 for William Wrigley, founder of the famous Wrigley's brand of chewing gum, and is still standing today at 3344 Country Club Park. 
the Wrigleys had moved out by the time Wrong Again was filmed. And according to Leo McCary, the owner at the time of the shoot was Mrs. Borden of Borden's Malted Milk. Quote, She was sitting by the camera, enjoying every minute. She said, Why do they have to stop the scene when the horse comes up to the door? I said, Well, we duplicate the interior of the house at the studio because we can't take the horse into your home. She says, Why not? I wish Daddy was here. He'd get the biggest kick out of it. Go ahead, take the horse into the house. Well, we couldn't take her up on it. End quote. Following some dialogue at crossed purposes with Ollie and the millionaire, played by Del Henderson, the boys follow their instructions and lead the horse into a very grand living room. Born in Ontario, Canada, Del Henderson was a prolific film actor. Beginning his career in the theatre, he eventually traded the stage for the screen starring in Max Sennett shorts as early as 1912, and he even directed films starring the likes of Sid Chaplin and Chester Conklin. His career filmography is extensive and includes roles in two other Laurel and Hardy pictures, The Laurel Hardy Murder Case and Our Relations. Interestingly, and perhaps illustrating the natural development of the team's comedies, there is a surprisingly large amount of dialogue in the picture, especially considering that it was made as a silent film. The outside sequences between both Henderson and Hardy and Laurel and Hardy are excellent examples of this. Ollie relates their instructions to take Blue Boy into the house, and Stan's disbelief and attempts to process the facts are wonderful. Equally so are some relatively extensive yet lovely conversations between the team inside the house when the boys are waiting for the owner to come downstairs, and Ollie explains to Stan, These millionaires are peculiar. They just think the opposite to other people. Once Stan reluctantly grasps this concept, he can accept anything unusual that happens for the remainder of the visit. This is a recurring theme throughout the picture, and gave it the working title, Just the Reverse. According to Hal Roach, the hand twist gesture that Ollie uses to signify to Stan that the millionaire's thinking is the opposite, or just the reverse, of theirs, came from an in-joke within the studio. When the writers were trying to create a comic situation, they would think about the dramatic angle and then give it a little twist to make it funny. The hand twist was their way of communicating what needed to be done. Wrong Again could be considered another key moment in the team's development, certainly regarding the boys' characters. There are some lovely moments which help to deepen our understanding of Stan and Ollie as individuals, and also their relationship dynamic, with Ollie clearly demonstrating his almost fatherly role, helping Stan come to terms with the strangeness of the situation. Ollie's gentlemanly nature is also evident after he trips over a life-size statue of the nude Roman goddess Venus. The figure breaks into three pieces, and as Ollie attempts to reassemble it, he cannot bring himself to look at or touch the statue's bottom. Instead, he removes his coat, averts his eyes, wraps the coat around the posterior, and replaces it as best he can. He doesn't realise that he has incorrectly reassembled the midsection, so Venus's bottom is facing forwards directly underneath her navel. Later, when Stan spots the misassembled figure, he is visibly confused and troubled, and the camera remains on him as he struggles to process what he's seeing. Now this is clearly another McCary influenced sequence, almost allowing a whole minute for Stan to go through a range of thoughts and reactions to this freakish figurine. The misunderstanding between Henderson and the boys becomes even more ridiculous when the millionaire shouts down his next instruction to place Blue Boy on top of the piano. There are some great comedy moments as the boys attempt to get the horse onto the piano. Once the horse is standing atop the instrument though, the boys knock the piano's front support leg away, leaving them both hanging onto it to prevent a violent crash and a possible injury to the animal. Typically and hilariously, Ollie ends up on all fours supporting the weight of both the piano and the horse on his back. This is a technically brilliant gag, and the mechanics of it can only be imagined. However they achieved it, the overall effect is terrific, and the whole thing being ridiculous and hilarious in equal measure. The film's finale sees the real Blue Boy arrive, and the boys must admit to having made a slight mistake. Stan and Ollie see the funny side falling into fits of giggles, but the millionaire, who is far from amused, chases the boys and the horse down the street with his loaded shotgun in hand. 
Charlie Hall can also be spotted in the final scene, making a cameo as an extra in the group of nosy neighbours. Hall appeared in more Laurel and Hardy films than any other actor, popping up in 47 in total. Wrong Again has enjoyed an excellent reputation, with several experts and film historians praising it strongly. Leonard Maltin identified it as a favourite, and both Simon Louvish and Glenn Mitchell described it as a masterpiece, while Charles Barr and Kip Harness thought it one of the best of all the boys' silent films. On its theatrical release, contemporary audiences also received the picture very warmly indeed. Another very funny comedy by the two real funny comedians, from, from the Silver Family Theatre in Greenville in Michigan. These Laurel and Hardys are the best comedies you can buy. They always get the laughs. From the Liberty Theatre in Ontario, Canada. Wrong again? Just the reverse. The boys bring down the house as usual. From the Screenland Theatre, Nevada, Ohio. And excellent! This pair is great. I have yet to get one of theirs that doesn't please. From the Star Theatre in Wendell, North Carolina. As 1928 drew to a close, so too did the age of the silent picture. Just as filming on Wrong Again got underway, a new and significant figure arrived on the scene whose impact on not only Laurel and Hardy, but on the Hal Roach studios more widely, could never be overstated. As part of the team of engineers from the Victor Talking Machine Company sent from Camden, New Jersey to Culver City, tasked with effecting converting the studio to one able to make talking pictures, Elmer R. Regis arrived on the scene. Quote, Hollywood, November 27th. Installation of sound equipment at the Hal Roach studio is expected to be completed in time for the start of production by the first of the year following arrival last week of Elmer R. Regis, expert from the Victor Recording Laboratories at Camden, New Jersey, to supervise preparation of stages. No sound stages will be erected, but those now in operation will be soundproofed. Richard Courier, film editor for Hal Roach, accompanied Regis. Installation will be directed by W. W. Clark of Victor. And that was in the Exhibitors Herald and Moving Picture World, December 12th, 1928. Little did anybody realise just how much of an impact Regis was to have at the lot of fun. Hal Roach quickly understood how valuable a man like Elmer would be in this strange, uncharted world of the talkies. Before long, Elmer Regis was placed on the payroll, taking up the post of Chief Sound Engineer at the Hal Roach Studios. Assisting me today in getting a white horse on top of a piano is returning guest, author of the Laurel and Hardy Encyclopedia and friend of the podcast, Mr. Glenn Mitchell. Welcome back, Glenn. Thank you, Patrick. It's great to be here. This is, I say here, I'm in the same back room at home, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And you are always welcome, Glenn. Always welcome. Thank you. Um, I really do look forward to these episodes when I know I can get to chat with you about um, some of our favourite films. It is a real treat for me. Well, I really um, enjoy it myself. So uh, let us let us well. press on. <laughs> Let us press on. Absolutely. Now, before before we before we dive into the episode proper, um, at the very start of today's show, uh, Glenn, I dedicated this episode to the memory of your good friend Dave Wyatt. Yes. Um, now, sadly, I never got the chance to meet Dave. Uh, I did hear him speak a couple of times um, at a couple of conventions, but unfortunately, our paths never crossed. Um, I was hoping to get him on a future podcast episode, um, but obviously, that wasn't meant to be. So, um, before we do dive in properly, um, I just wanted to pay a little tribute to Dave. Um, you know, for all all of his work in protecting and promoting the legacy of Laurel and Hardy and, and much, much more besides. Um, so I just wondered if I could ask you to just say a few words of tribute to Dave. Yes, it's very difficult to know where to start. I suppose the obvious thing in the context of Laurel and Hardy podcast is to remind everybody that he was one of the major Laurel and Hardy collectors and historians. And of course, added film 107. He was the one who identified um, Now I'll Tell One as being a Laurel and Hardy appearance. It wasn't known to be the pair of them until he uh, proved that and dug, dug out Real 2. Um, we're still looking for Real 1. But he, yeah, he added to the list, and uh, he was also one of the people who worked the hardest on researching their solo work. I mean, I'm, I'm in extreme 
extremely extensive work over a great many years. And he added to our knowledge of the solo films enormously, both in terms of um, tracing the films themselves and in finding the information and chronicling their often rather obscure history. He found out an awful, an awful lot about them. And yeah. um, so it, for those, those alone, I think the world of Laurel and Hardy history owes David an enormous debt. Absolutely. I remember, funnily enough, we had Rob Stone on the very first episode of the podcast when we talked about Lucky Dog, and he he mentioned um, he'd been preparing his book on the solo films, mm. um, and he caught wind of uh, another chap who had also been preparing a book on the solo films, and it was Dave, and he, he, he happened to meet Dave, and uh, Rob was saying, you know, Dave just said, look, you're much further through than I am, how can I help you? You know, and it was just a sort of lovely, lovely gesture. Yeah. That was very typical of him, actually. He was in enormously generous this is not always true of collectors <laughs> it can, not by any means but no he he was always very generous in terms of sharing knowledge the things in his collection he'd let people borrow them um, he'd screen them for people he wanted to get them out there he wasn't the sort of magpie collector who just wants to sit on it all and say i've got this <laughs> if that wasn't him he would show stuff and let people see things and as I said, very generous with information and, and he, he'd help people. And it was such a huge collection and, and a very diverse one. He, I don't want to type him as a Laurel and Hardy or silent comedy man alone. He, he's, his interests were, were very, very broad and extensive. Ditto his collection. He was another one of those in whose homes you couldn't really move. <laughs> it's just a vast amount of stuff. Um, so, no, you know, we... we you know, we talk about stuff just as, say, like the Goon Show, as easily as we might talk about Lauren Hardy, Keaton Chatton, Charlie right. Chase, and so on. And as I said, he wanted people to see these things, to get them out there. And in more recent years, he was very heavily involved and very highly instrumental in getting the DVDs out of uh, what Lupino Lane is, is one of the one of the ones that attracted me the most at the time. Billy Bevan, Not Long Ago, and uh, Lloyd Hamilton. The, you know, he, he was getting the stuff out there, making making sure people could see it. And um, it's very difficult to say, really um, encapsulate David, because you know, his activities were, were so so broad. I, and it's such a long period to talk about. I knew him for over 42 years. Uh, we first met, unsurprisingly, at a Sons of the Desert meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was he was running sixteen mil, and um, we got chatting and um, found that um, we had a lot of um, you know, shared interests, the sort of things we were interested in and uh, collected. And quite quite often, you know, we we um, you know collaborated or cooperated on things. Um, in more recent times, we did some two hander presentations at the Cinema Museum. You know, we're kind of not not quite a Laurel and Hardy, but. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, just bouncing off each other and um, co-presenting, and he he was a he was actually was a very good presenter for a, a man who seemed to be in person a little, little shy, not, not quite sure of himself. He was a very entertaining presenter, and um, as I said in a brief obit, I was asked to write for this for the Cinema Museum's website. Um, he had a presenting style that was informed but informal. Yeah, perfect. Can't really add anything to that. And people really enjoyed his presentations, and um, we, we're just going to miss him. I'm going to miss him enormously. And I'm just, you know, and it was so sudden. His, his, his end was so sudden. I knew that he'd had some health problems because he nearly died in the house fire several years ago. And he, I know his respiratory system was damaged by this, but but he seemed to be in fairly good shape and very functional and, and so on. And so suddenly being informed that he'd gone was a huge shock. And uh, I'm still struggling to find the words rather. But, uh, he, he, but he was really one of the most important collectors and historians in this game. Make no mistake of that. Never, under, no, never underestimate or well, undervalue that. He was one of the major names. Yes. Yeah, well, his his name always crops up in, in any in any book that you read on the silent clowns or silent 
film or it, Dave Wyatt always crops up. And I thought, yes. I kept thinking to myself, who is this Dave Wyatt character? I'm going to have to meet this guy at yes. some point. Well, he was but, one of those uh, guys whose names appear in a lot of books, other people's books, generally. Yes, yes. I, I don't think he was ever really strong on completing a book project. I don't think that was ever <laughs> going to be his forte. But he would work on them and contribute to others. And as as with finishing up his research associates or Rob Stone's book on the solo films. Mm. And he, he, he would organise festivals. Um, a lot of people used to go to his, or well, various festivals at the old, the old Scarlet Cinema. Uh, there was Laurel Hardy, W.C. Fields, I remember. And a lot of animation festivals. But yeah, a lot of people went to those Scala shows in the old days, and this includes their original premises around the back of Good Street before they got moved to the to the place people remember now, which is King's Cross. That was where they moved to when they had right. when they had to get out of what was originally the Scala Theatre. And he was doing um, yeah, repertory programming for them even at that time, and continued to after they moved to King's Cross. And a lot of people who went to those Scala shows and remember them. I think don't know that he was the one who was organising them, oh, or, they right. or they don't remember that he compiled them. Yeah. So and and the and the Scala Cinema history has become a bit of a cult thing, I think now. And some people, you know, I think where it's a bit of a badge of honour that they used to go to the Scala in the old days, and, and quite right too. Um, yeah. But I don't know if they necessarily remember that it was Dave Wyatt who was putting together things like the animation programmes and so on. Right. Okay. So, uh, but this was long, long, long ago. <laughs> when I were a lad. Mean, but the cat out. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, thank you for that, Glenn. That's uh, that's painted a, ro- a really nice picture for Dave. Um, say, I, I really wish I could have um, had the chance to get to know him, but uh, it wasn't to be. It wasn't to be. I'll handle this delicate situation. You've heard the worst. Now prepare yourself for the best. Now cheer up. Smile. That's right. Remember, every cloud has a silver line. That's right. Any bird can build a nest, but it isn't everyone that can lay an egg. Is it, Ollie? That's right. So if we can move on now then to today's film in focus, um, hopefully this is one that Dave would have appreciated. I'm sure he would. Uh, this one is a bit of a belter, or at least I think it is. Um, wrong again. Yes. Uh, where, do, where do you stand with this one, Glenn? Is it a belter or just the reverse? Well, I could, <laughs> well, I could have just said right again, but uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh no, I, I think it's I think it's marvelous. It's one of them. They're more unusual films, and probably one of the yeah. most original, allowing for repetition of some things in either direction, you know, before and after. But um, it's it's extraordinary in that it was only really completed when the soundtrack turned up. Ah, right. Prior to that, it seemed an interesting, oddball, and fairly funny film. Right. But once the disc track came back. It completed it, okay. and then it seemed like a classic, albeit perhaps a second Ashton one in Laurel and Hardy, the Laurel and Hardy context. Yes. But yeah. that made a huge difference, and it, it's it's really strange that I know. Well, I know music's important at silent cinema, but mm. an awful lot of them do play mute if you're just running them for yourself or to an audience, which you shouldn't really do. But um, but somehow this this more than any of the others benefits from that track. And I do wonder to what degree it was edited to anticipate having that track and, and how it might have seemed to contemporary audiences where the theatre wasn't wired for sound <laughs> and they just had a regular, regular musicians playing for it. Um, I do wonder. The, the peculiar thing ab- about it is that it actually looks like a talkie. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it quite quite uncanny in that regard. In the 1960s and indeed into the early 70s, the Laurel and Hardy scholarship, as it were, hadn't, hadn't yet got to the point where we knew exactly what was in those early diss tracks because they weren't known to exist. And William K. Everson, in his book published in 1967, somehow conveyed the impression that the pre-unaccustomed-as-we-are films 
that had some sort of track were quite likely to have been part talkies. He conveyed that impression to me at any rate, because uh, uh, he, he didn't say that they were li- released in silent and music and effects versions. What he said was limited sound versions. That's how he described them. And he, uh, sp- in terms of wrong again, he said that, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact words, but it's essentially undou- you know, undoubtedly paced for sound, but today only the silent version is, exists and at times seems awkward and unsure of itself. Yes, yes, that's right. So I, I think he was right in suggesting that the uh, the editing of it was paced to allow for a track. Yeah, that's that's that was exactly the words, wasn't it? Paced for sound, yeah. yeah. I wrote it down actually somewhere, just uh, an offbeat comedy that can only be seen at a disadvantage now that it was... Uh, now that uh, it was made as both a silent and sound release and undoubtedly paced for sound. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think he said limited sound, but um, mm. but anyway. Um, and, yeah, I mean, they, they were doing part talkies in that period. I've seen some of them, and they're, they're rather strange hybrids because you'll get uh, a, a score with effects and dialogue titling for most of the film. Then every now and then, or maybe just once, you know, the uh, the soundtrack will segue from the orchestra score into ambient sound and dialogue, and they, they and they do their bit, they do their talky scene, and they slide out back into a silent movie with a with an orchest- orchestral track. So 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 that, you know, such things were done, but the assumption I think, or the implication there, was that that was what Baron and Hardy were doing, and uh, yeah, and. Um, not knowing any more than that, when I first saw Wrong Again properly, I was watching it and thinking, well, actually, yes, this does actually look like at least a part talkie from which the sound's missing. Um, particularly in that scene where the two, the two of them sit down and Ollie explains, you know, about millionaires being eccentric, doing everything the wrong way, or just the reverse. Just <laughs> with a <the> hand twisting <laughs> gesture, yeah, of, of which yeah. more and non. But, um, yeah. But yeah, that actually looked like a dialogue sequence that just yeah, had yeah, intertitles cut in for a silent version. Yeah. And well, the, the, move, move on several years, and the diss tracks for Wrong Again, Liberty, Bacon Grabbers, Angora Love, That's My Wife, come back from oblivion. And of course, they aren't part talkies at all. They're, they're music and effects tracks for silence. And of those, the track for Wrong Again is the most fully integrated. Uh, the, uh, the two organ tracks, Angora Love and Bacon Grabbers, just aren't very good. The other orchestral tracks are good, very yes. good. But this is the one where every music cue is some sort of comment, a musical pun, in a sense, on the action. Every stage, every step. And um, I think Randy said it was Nathaniel Shilkrit who arranged yes. it. Yeah. And of course, he was the, uh, he was Victor, Victor Records' top man on the West Coast. I think we what they now call an A&R now. He was the, um, what did he say it was? He was the director of light music for Victor and produced hundreds of hot dance band records in the late 1920s. Which I think is why, uh, well, Randy goes on to say this is why the, the score was sort of crammed with popular tunes rather than, you know, yeah. incidental music, let's say. Absolutely. Uh, he, he forms a parallel with Carl Stalling, who was the musical director for the Warner Brothers cartoons for many years, oh, yeah, right. in that each of them had this vast mental library of tunes. You name, you name a gag or a situation, they could come up with the right tune that would refer to that. And to for, skill. Yeah, it's an incredible skill, feat of memory, and a... And a well, an ability to apply that memory, which is often the difference between a mere collector of information and a creative artist. It becomes something constructive when you can apply that information. And Shilkrit could, Stalin could. And by George, did Shilkrit apply it this time? <laughs> what, do you th- uh-huh. what do you think of... Um, th- yeah, the horse is drinking from a fish tank. The orchestra plays How Dry I Am. <laughs> the 
the, the wagon gets smashed and it's thanks for the buggy ride. <laughs> 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 and, yeah. Oh, there are just so so many in there. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ollie looking coyly at the horse, uh, horse's owner, and it's where to get those eyes. <laughs> much, the, much, much later on, when the the millionaire and his mother are about about to find out what they really got, is the orchestra is playing. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, they get the horse and the piano. It's, I'm sitting on top of the world. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful stuff. The um, yeah. the one that uh, intrigues me more than most of them uh, is when the robbery is being discussed. Uh, Stan and Ollie hear about uh, the reward oh, yeah. and so on and so forth. Blue Boy's been stolen. There's a reward. And the orchestra is playing Jimmy Valentine or Look Out, Look Out, Look Out for Jimmy Valentine. <laughs> It's about a safe cracker. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Valentine was a creation of the author O. Henry for a short story in 1903, which was adapted in 1910 as a stage play called Alias Jimmy Valentine. And at about the same time as that, there was a vaudeville show, um, Gus Edwards' Musical Review or something like that. And for that, um, he wrote... Um, that song, Look Out, Look Out, Look Out for Jim Valentine, which was a hit from the show. And the stage play was filmed a few times, 1915, 1920, and again in 1928 with William Haynes, with a disc score again. And, of course, this was recent MGM history when the Wrong Again trap was being prepared. Alias, Billy, Alias Jimmy Valentine was just out, or recently out. So it was, you know, it, it was bang on topical for the track of Wrong Again. I mean, that's the only reason I mentioned that. But also the fact that most people know, most people today won't know what that tune is and that it refers to uh, a famous uh, safe track of Burglar. So they're talking about a robbery. It's Jimmy Valentine. <laughs> uh, oh, who's, who's, who's also referenced in the pair of tights. Oh, okay. Any Walker title card referring to tight wads, Ed Kennedy and Stuart Irwin. <laughs> yeah, I know two titles. And it says e was it e even Jimmy and Valentine couldn't open their pockets. I think it was something like that. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very so, good. <laughs> uh, uh, do you want to go on? Do you want to go on any more about this music, or shall we talk about the film? <laughs> you can talk. No music. If you want to carry on, if you got any more on the music, it's. Really, I think it's really nice to be able to to sort of spotlight those individual tracks because for, for you know plebs like me. I've got no idea what the, I'll hear it, and I'll you know I'll, I'll watch the film over and over again. It will mean nothing to me, and I can read the cue sheet, and it will mean nothing to me. But this podcast is, I think, is a great way of being able to actually 
showcase those pieces of music. Yeah, that's probably the only the only way of doing it really in the audio format is is brilliant. So uh, if there's anything else you want to just pick up on, um, you know, by all means. Uh, I noticed um, you were talking about uh, sitting on top of the world. That was also in Liberty. Yes. As was. Um, where did you get that hat? Oh, yes. Also appears in uh, We Fall Down. Yes. And, and mm. possibly Liberty as well, I think. when they It's always when they swap in hats, when they do the mm. hat swapping routine. Yeah. That, that little track always kicks in. Yeah, even, even if it's just a brief reference to it, yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But there were so more. Um, the, it kicks off after, after the MGM fanfare. The, the, the music starts with Comrades, which is a wonderful title just for Laurel and Hardy. This is a this is a song. It was probably best known, ironically, on the British music halls. Even though it was written in America by a British expat, a guy from Glasgow named Felix McLennan. Right. And at that time, uh, he was in the states. He did eventually come back to Britain. He died here, but um, he wrote that in eighty seven. And um, Tom Costello, the British music hall star, toured the states over eighteen eighty seven into eighteen eighty eight. Um, apparently heard, heard the song while he was over there um, was raised very taken with it and eventually when he came back to Britain um, started to perform it on stage here well he didn't do so until 1890 he'd been back for probably the best part of a year so it took him a while to adopt it but right. but he was stuck with it it was so popular people wouldn't let right. him, yeah, he, they wouldn't let him go until he sang Comrades <laughs> he was rather, rather, frankly, lumbered with it for as long as he lived, but it, but it was a huge success for him. But I, I think probably through Tom Costello's use of it, it became better known in this side of the Atlantic than it was in America. But it's but it's a very um, transatlantic song in its origins. So a Scottish-born composer, but in America at the time, a bit popular, popularised by a British singer, and uh, he. Now, he, he was one of those veterans of variety who sort of came back in the 30s, died in 1943, I think. But later on, he was performing again for modern audiences and one of the sort of the veterans sort of crowd. But yes, but that's uh, Comrade. And it did become a bit of a, a cliche in this country, the a sort of favourite of buskers and drunks and so on. Um, <laughs> it, I mentioned the Goon Show earlier on. I think they use it in that context, the idea of, <laughs> Ned Seagoon and Co. down and out in the gutter singing Comrades and After Pennies, you know. <laughs> but, but it was one to play on the heartstrings somewhat. Uh, right. But um, but yeah, um, but thus Comrades. That that horsey tune that comes in and out, um, one I've always been familiar with since I was a kid, I never knew what it was called. I never knew the title of it. And eventually I found out, and it's just called Horses. <laughs> <laughs> I was incredibly disappointed. I, I felt really short-changed <laughs> that it was just called Horses. <laughs> but I was, Brilliant. Yeah, a novelty hit the 20s. Yeah, what can we call this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lyric is about a guy complaining that his uh, his lady friend or wife, whatever, lady, is only uh, only cares about horses. It's about horses, nothing but horses, or something like that. And uh, but um, say a, a fun novelty hit of the twenties, but nothing better than that for wrong again. And um, another vaudeville staple comes in when um, we first see Stan entering the film. Because, of course, we've got that scene with Ollie and the horse's owner. And then yes. we find that as Ollie tries to put Blue Boy the horse back into the stable, behind this, struggling to get out is Stan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as Stan emerges, the orchestra references Mr. Gallagher and Mr. Sheen. Okay. So, in other words, here's the other half of the partnership. Right. That's what it's that's saying. Good. And, of course, Gall Gallagher and Sheen were vaudeville veterans as a double act in the yeah. States. And uh, Al Sheen was the uncle of the Marx Brothers. 
I was going to say, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's very well known. So, uh, but yeah, but the, the, the song that were, which by which they remembered, even though I understand they didn't start to use it until relatively late on, I think after they, after they split up for a while and then came back, uh, right. Mr. Gallagher and Mr. Sheen, and there we are with that in wrong again. So oh, That's lovely. That's good. It's... Um, God, there are just so many, there are so many. Enter the gladiators when they clump into the mansion. Beautiful doll for the statue. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the statue, which which appears in uh, Dizzy Daddies. Dizzy Daddies, yes. It's the, ex- the exact same statue, isn't it? It has to be the exact yes. statue. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make more than one of those. <laughs> no, no, no. no. But I, I thought, because I was looking at it, and I think it was in Randy's book, and I thought, I'll, I'll just have a look. It'll be a similar statue. Mm. It's the exact same yes. statue, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, just as the, the, the Blue Boy painting is, is the same one that Ollie has in Early to Bed. Yes, that's right. That's right. Now that's interesting because um, I mean I don't know if you're going to come onto this a bit a little bit later on, but um, Leo McCary always uh, well he always claims he when talking to Peter Bogdanovich he claimed that he came up with the idea of of the storyline for Wrong Again mm, yes. based around the fact that he was sitting at home and on his living room wall he had a copy of Gainsborough's Blue Boy as you do. <laughs> <laughs> haven't, haven't you? Haven't you got one? <laughs> Not, I've misplaced it somewhere, I think. <laughs> but it just makes me wonder, you know, because, it, I mean, is that just a tall, that must be just a tall tale, just to, you know, spin a yarn, surely. It, it, or did he think, well, I'll, I'll loan it out for early to bed and then we'll get a bit more mileage on it in, <laughs> in another film later on? <laughs> or, 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 or maybe it was one of those portraits that everybody had in their living room in 1928. You, Who knows? You don't know, actually, because it was... Some there was something of a fad for it. Now, the other McCary story is that he, it was he was at the uh, he was at the dentist, and, the, and it was the dentist yes, who had the right. Blue Boy Reaper on the wall. That's so right. The other version, McCary is at home after a tonsillectomy, and he's got the Reaper on the wall. That's um, it. Yeah. yeah. McCary's stories can vary, but um, McCary <laughs> can vary. But just <laughs> but the thing about it is that there was something of a vogue for Blue Boy because. It, at least in the States, it was famous. And it was a bit of a coup, actually, for the United States. It had it actually dates from around the 1770s. And it's Thomas Gainsborough, and it's a classic, classic British painting. Um, in 1921, it was sold to an American billionaire whose, uh, whose name escapes me for the moment. Um, oh, yeah, Henry E. Huntington. Uh, he paid seven hundred and seventy-eight thousand dollars for it—a record sum at the time. I won't try to say what that converts to in, in modern currency because they never work, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it never translates. But at the time, it was this huge amount, and the, there was a big row about it leaving Britain because this is this is a thing that recurs now. Please save this masterpiece from leaving the country how often have we heard that and yes, I, I, it's not only a slightly hypocritical for the british to be saying that about one of their uh, historical objects <laughs> well yes <laughs> yeah but we won't go into that it, but it recurs and it's may have been the first really high profile example of that and uh, uh, it, it it had a, a a big one last exhibition in london before it actually was transported to the states in early 1922 um, so it was famous then because of all the fuss about it being bought and leaving leaving Great Britain for America. So it already had a, a certain celebrity to it, and especially with the record price paid for it. Now, Huntington didn't actually live all that long, died, I think, in 1927, after which the painting was exhibited publicly in the Los Angeles area, I think. And, it, and again, everybody knew it. And it was it, there was quite a bit of fuss. So I can well imagine that quite a few 
reproductions of this were, were sold based on the sheer fame of it because of the of the of the, uh, the controversial nature of its purchase and export. It's 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 um it's quite interesting. Um, it was it was brought back recently for a centenary exhibition at the London's National Gallery, and a journalist from the Guardian writing up the story suggested that they should have screened wrong again to accompany it <laughs> yes, just, to, it just to show how famous the painting was at the time and, yeah, and i think yeah. that's an excellent idea i wish i, I wish they'd done it yeah but, yeah that was a shame yeah but, but, but that is almost certainly why it was at the time in america particularly it was a hugely famous painting and known to be a very known to be a very valuable one too hence i think it turning up in, in ollie's mansion in early to bed a, an example of just how rich he was meant to be. <laughs> that's great. That's lovely. That's a lovely little gem. Fantastic. It may also be interesting to know that Mr. Stan Laurel, who has been the lifelong friend, advisor, and severest critic, guided Mr. Hardy to the pinnacle of success. Mr. Laurel says that after viewing the situation from all sides, he is thoroughly reconciled to the fact that the moving picture industry is still in its infancy. So, yes, McCary claimed to have come up with the story, and I can believe this. But no, McCary, I think we can safely credit with the idea, and this is one of the very few Laurel and Hardys in which he had specific director credit. We, yeah. I mean, we know he was around and he had this supervisor credit, which... For a lot of people in the industry, it was a bit of a joke credit. Not, I think, with McCary, but quite often people were credited as supervisor. Um, right. People were expressing scepticism over it. But I think it's fair to say that McCary was pretty much the guiding hand in the early days, irrespective of the name director. Yeah. But this is, this is one of the very few occasions in which he was actually the name director on the picture. A lot of Hardy pictures. Yeah. So and we and we do. Well, you can certainly see his guiding hand in in you know a number of silence that he he isn't the director of, mm. um, you know, and uh, yeah, where where this the pace really slows down and you can sort of see that lingering on Stan's expressions and different yes. things like that, you know. So yeah, absolutely, the, I would agree the, with that. The slowing it down and and of course the that hand gesture, that which we uh, briefly referred to earlier, the the twisting of the hand. In this case, it's Ollie explaining that millionaires are peculiar and they do everything just the reverse to everybody else. And uh, without having to go into any more detail later on, yes, we know they do it again in the big noise. <laughs> you know what? What? I've got a clue. I think Mr. Hartley is just a little bit cracked. Well, I ought to know. All inventors are like that. They're eccentric. They're not like you and me. They're different. How do you mean? They are just a little bit twisted. Twisted? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we won't mention the big no, no. just now. We're, we're, no. we're enjoying ourselves at the moment. Exactly. We will just, just that's, that's out of the way now. Uh, and, uh, but apparently this was this was McCary. It was a pet jester. He had apparently he had a number of um, very contagious uh, visual shorthand expressions for doing things. And which, which caught on among his friends, and this was one of them. This was putting a comic twist on an idea, and they used they used it. Um, so the only time it wrote, they used it in Wrong Again, and the working title of the movie was just the reverse. And uh, and Brandy tells us that it, unusually for them, it was actually shot that way into beginning. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yes, I did notice that. Yeah, which was unusual for them. I wonder, I wonder why they did that. I don't know, but um, maybe they just wanted to get the horse and the piano bit out of the way. <laughs> you know, let's just yeah, exactly. let's get get that done. You know, <laughs> everything else can fit around it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Yes. No, of course we we do have to say who trained the horses or the horse because apparently didn't they use or engage two horses but use one or something. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, I know because I, I just assumed it would be uh, Tony Campanaro, who I think was u usually the animal trainer, but it wasn't no. in this case, was it? No, no. Um, I, I can't pretend. Jacob Lin Jacob Lindell. Yes, I've got a note of this. I can't honestly pretend to remember the names in this particular. So I'm, I'm quite good with names, but uh, yeah, Clarence Jacob Swede Lindell. Uh, that's uh, it. Clarence Fat Jones. 
Oh, right. Yeah, Clarence Fat Jones and Jacob Sweet Linda. Um, okay. Apparently, they're responsible for the horse. Um, but uh, yeah, it was quite a wonderfully trained horse. It's obviously, obviously been trained to knock a hat off with its nose. <laughs> a lot. A lot. <laughs> Was it 15 times or something never, it gets knocked off? Never had the patience. I think it's 15 count. times, I'll, yeah. I'll take I'm pretty word. sure Randy does a count. Yeah, I'll take your word for that. Uh, but, yeah. um, but very well trained and, and docile. I mean, for heaven's sake, actually persuading a horse to step on a piano. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't go to try it, but um, <laughs> no, no. I love, I love how Randy says in his book something like, the horse, the horse is... Identity has has remained elusive, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it does look a lot like Susie from the music box. <laughs> this is true. This is true. It's a white horse. I mean, what... <laughs> but I do like that. I think it's a lovely little lemur. Remained elusive. It's fab- yes. fabulous. No, it's nicely nicely put. <laughs> yes, I like it. Uh, Steady, Susie. And just speaking of um, uh, Leo McCary as well in it and his stories, um, in the same interview with Peter Bogdanovich, um, I think it was from 1968, I think I'm right in that, um, he was also giving his information about um, the owner of the house for the exterior shots. Oh, it's another millionaire. Yes. A, gen- a, yeah. a deceased by then millionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, there was two because the, the, it was originally the house was originally built for the Wrigleys oh, of Wrigley yeah. Spearmint Gum. Mm, yeah, it was their house originally, but they had moved on to the the malted milks, the, the Borden's malted. Yes, milks. yes, Borden's <laughs> malted milks. What nice was the guy's name? So he, he he'd been dead for some time at the time they used the place, but um, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but the, but for the yeah the mansion exteriors that that was that was that house. Yes. It was three three four four Country Club Park. Hmm. Um, the Wrigleys had moved out, and according to McCary, the owner at the time was Mrs. Borden of Borden's Malted Milk. Hmm. And uh, McCary said she was sitting by the camera enjoying every minute. She said, "Why do they have to stop the scene when the horse comes up to the door?" I said, "Well, we duplicate the interior of the house at the studio because we can't take the horse into your home." She says, "Why not? I wish Daddy was here. He'd get the biggest kick out of it." Go ahead, take the horse into the house. <laughs> I said, well, we couldn't take her up on it. <laughs> no. the, the guy's name is Isaac Milbank. Right. Apparently. right. And, uh, yeah, again, uh, deceased, rather, uh, as per the guy who bought the painting. Um, but um, but anyway, that's, yeah, they, so they rather cleverly intercut mansion exterior with interior and done in the studio. <laughs> So, uh, what about supporting cast, Glenn? We've got um, um, Del Henderson. Yeah, yeah, familiar, familiar face to Hal Roach. We know him from Murder Case as the culprit in Drag. Yes, <laughs> um, yes yeah. Was, Why was that? Why was the culprit in Drag? That's a bizarre thing. I never, I never knew. Um, other than a, a reasonable means of throwing people off the scent, who's going to suspect a sweet old lady? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. That's yeah. yeah that's silly of me. Yeah, yes. The, uh, and, and other than purely recreational purposes, I can't suggest any other option. But, <laughs> the, uh, but he's the uh, sympathetic um, judge in our relations, as I remember. Oh, yes. Yeah, all that. The, the, all, all, the, all the Lodge stuff, yes. <laughs> the Masonic, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, yeah. And um, he, he's in some of the Charlie Chases, and at least one of the Our Gangs, and um, one of those people who's in, in and out of Roach often enough to be familiar. Yes, so, yeah. uh, he was pretty prolific, though, wasn't he? Because he he was in hundreds and hundreds of films, I think. Oh, he, yes, throughout his career, yes, a massive a, film, huge filmography, and um, yeah. he went some way back. Another Canadian, I think. Then we had um, think of those who who went back a long time. Um, the uh, the millionaire's mother, Josephine Crowell, who went back to Griffith films in the teens. Oh, okay. Yeah, she had, um, you know, what might call a proper upbringing. She was in D.W. Griffith's pictures in the teens. <laughs> by, that <laughs> time do, yeah, by that time doing Harold Roach comedies. And she's in, a few, <laughs> she's in a few of the Harold Lloyds. The one that people tend to remember is Hot Water, where she's the mother-in-law. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, I so, noticed that. Yeah, she's, that's her. And uh, so who else we got? Fred Holmes, the stable boy. Not much I can right. say beyond that. William Gillespie, who one sees more often in earlier 20s Roach pictures. As the right. the horse's owner, um, our old friend Sam Lufkin, my one time sort of namesake. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Those who know me and know these would know know that story, so I didn't bother with that. But uh, but yeah, Sam Lufkin was in everything. 
and um, Harry Bernard, perennial cop. <laughs> of course, with a smoking backside. Yes, and a gag, which of course was another um, recurring one. They, they'd used that in Slipping Wives, yes. and again in uh, the longer version of Trump and, Trump and Oxford. That has the same gag. I tell you, I didn't have my glasses on. Why don't you be careful? You almost blew my brains out. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah of course so, it does. So they've got some mileage out of that. Um, Char- Charlie Hall. The ne- have you ever spotted Charlie Hall the next time? I never yeah, noticed. Easily. Just... Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. really obvious. Yeah, right, I... right at the. He's just. He's one of the gang. You know, when when Harry Bernard comes in, yeah. with his smoking behind. Before he turns round, there's a group of people, and he's just to Harry's right. Oh, good the left, as you look at the screen. Oh, good and he's he's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, he's he's great. I love us spotting Charlie yeah. <laughs> cropping up everywhere. Always worth, always worth seeing. And uh, another of the general purpose men, Jack Hill, the man on the backboard. <laughs> oh, Jack Hill again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was everywhere. So, uh, so yes, there we have the supporting cast, including the the uh, anonymous horse, <laughs> elusive, elusive horse, elusive horse. <laughs> who played the who, who played the piano? Ha <laughs> ha. Um. <laughs> now, talking about the piano, this is a question I, I, I would love to ask you, and I don't know if you can you can shed any light on it. How did they do that piano gag? Because. Surely, you know, obviously Ollie's not taking the full weight of a piano and a horse. No. He's... Do you know how that was done? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing some sort of cantilevered thing, you know, because it's right up against the wall, isn't it, at the back? Yeah, you don't see the back. And um, I think, I forget whether anybody actually said this or whether there's something my late father worked out, because uh, he was an engineer. Um, and I think it might have been him who pointed to it and said, that's how they did that. Um, some sort of um, su- large supporting plate beneath the piano that would be, as you say, a cantilever thing from 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 behind to, yeah. to take, you know, to to provide a counterweight to it. That's the only way they could have done that. Yeah, it's brilliantly done. Absolutely, yes, yes, brilliantly done. Very carefully shot. You, you, that's why we're still speculating as to how they did it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's so 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 well done. Yeah, really really good stuff. Um, yes. Um, uh, yeah, I remember it came up in the, I think it was in the Blogheads um, Facebook group. Um, somebody was mentioning it. I think it was Bob Gassell from the Marx Brothers uh, podcast. Oh, and he, he commented, he said, what a great, you know, what a great thing it was and what a great gag and how, how, how on earth did they do it sort of thing. Um, and then a lot of people were speculating on, you know, different uh, ideas that they've got. But I, 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 I said it must be some kind of a seesaw mechanism that goes up and down. And it's because... You know, it would have killed him. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's all for taking things on his back. But yes. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Oh, yes. I mean, he would have either broken his neck, crushed his head, or both. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and if that didn't work, Stan's foot would have done the rest for him. Well, yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, yes. Um, no, um, I don't have anything more definitive to add about that. One thing I hadn't thrown in. Just go back to the music again. Um, mm. One tune that 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 recurs a lot, uh, the Cuckoo Waltz. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, that's of some interest because it, well, just before I go into that, um, some people think that's the title of the, of the Laurel and Hardy thing because mm. they've heard the title somewhere and they think, they think that the Laurel and Hardy thing is it's called the Cuckoo Waltz. Well, of course, it isn't. No. You know, it's Cuckoo or Dance the Cuckoos in its dance version or whatever. Cuckoo Waltz is a quite different tune. I th- the nearest I can get to a date for it is 1913, and it's Swedish, I think, by, oh, okay. by uh, J. E. Jonasson. And I, f- I think I first heard it independently of Laurel Hardy, at any rate, on an LP. My that's it, my late father again. He had a, an LP of Dutch barrel organ music. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, we, we are a family of eccentric tastes, and um, and it was just a charming record he picked up somewhere, and there was this this peculiar tune uh, on a peculiar instrument and that's when I first heard it and um, it gets used here and there again you may not remember this just for an age thing but there was a, a British TV sitcom called The Cuckoo Waltz um, it was quite quite good it, it wasn't one of the great classics but it was, it was a good sitcom and it, and it, and it used that tune as, as its sig <laughs> Thank you. 
And uh, some people now know that title of that tune because of that TV show, if they know it at all. But it gets used a lot in Wrong Again. And the uh, a big chunk of it from that from that Wrong Again track was used again in the opening scenes of Murder Case. We're back to Daniel Henderson again. Murder oh, Case, right. all, that, all that stuff on the dock side, all that music, is the yeah, Cuckoo yeah. Waltz lifted from the soundtrack for Wrong Again. Oh, wow. Yeah. I never, never, never cottoned on to that one. Yeah, that's that, good. But that's where it came from. And before the Road Studios got the incidental music sorted out mm. from around the time of Hogwarts mm-hmm. and Another Fine Mess, when we had mostly the Shield scores and yeah. so on happening, um, they were using what they could get and what they already had. And those um, music and effects tracks of silence were quite a fertile library, if, it's, if I'm not mixing the metaphor there. <laughs> Because a lot of the, um, well, quite often the opening title music of the first talkies is borrowed from those earlier tracks. Um, that's my weakness now from Hog, uh, from Huskow. Huskow is that's from the track from We Fall Down. The uh, uh, the tune that introduces unaccustomed as we are is the same one lifted bodily from the beginning of Liberty, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah. also they'd get used as incidental music, even if there were sound effects there that shouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, yeah, there's an hour gang from 1930 called Bear Shooters. And in a scene involving who else but Charlie Horse. Of course. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there we have the opening pursuit music from Liberty under the action, complete with little pop effects from when Tom Kennedy's shooting it. <laughs> but there's nothing on screen that warrants these pop <laughs> That's great. Oh, talk about reusing stuff. That's great. Yeah, and, and there were others. That's just an example. And say, until they finally got a good library of incidental music, they were recycling those those music and effects tracks in the talkies. Incredible. And, and, this, and this was the, the biggest chunk that they reused from any of those. Um, so the beginning of Murder Case is straight from Roman Camp. Isn't that a daisy? No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I, was just, I was going to just ask you, really, what you thought about... Because um, obviously this is Leo McCary's third in a row, and it's also his final uh, directorial credit, I think, for Laurel and Hardy. Mm. Um, although I think he's involved with other with some of the other films, but this is his last one as the director. Um, but, you know, just sort of tying that to... I mean, I always feel that Wrong Again is quite a, um, what do I say, I don't want to say mature comedy, but it's it's a very kind of, it's a much, a much more different comedy to the other silent comedies that they had. Um, mm. You know, there's no kind of um, uh, reciprocal destruction scenes and all mm. that kind of stuff. You know, it, it, it's, you know, it's nicely structured. It doesn't rely on old, you know, tried and tested formulas. No, is it only, um, only a minimum hat switch? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, and, and as we've, you know, as you've already said, it's, there's a lot of dialogue in it for a silent comedy, mm. a lot of dialogue. So it's a very kind of mature comedy and that silent comedy in that sense. And do you think there is a sort of a correlation between that and the fact that it is very, very close to the, tr- the switch over to talkies or is that, do you think just coincidental? Do you think they they had it in mind to sort of oh, I think dabble a bit more with dialogue or I, I think they were gearing up to it. Yeah, they knew it was they knew it was coming. Yeah, um, they'd been scoring the silence for a little while. And they knew the dialogue was the next step, and they they would have known the Roach was going to have the place wired for sound in the immediate future. It wasn't very far off. They would have been informed, and then everybody in the industry saw which way things were going. They knew that the talkies were going to be the future. And they better get used to that idea. <laughs> they were going, they were gearing up to it. I know that they'd already made a policy decision, more or less, to crank um, in terms of camera speed and, and in relation to projection speed, more or less up to what, had, what was it then accepted the sound speed, twenty four frames, because they wanted not to accelerate the exact the, the action. They didn't want to, yeah. to to go in for that. Under cranking thing, they were trying to make the action appear normal, but it, yeah. but even the the earlier well, say earlier the the Laurel and Hardys of the previous year, eighteen months, was they were still cranking, probably at about twenty to twenty two, for project for projection at twenty four, with that very slight exaggeration of movement. It just accelerated things a bit to give them enough of a lift, and the industry in general was doing that anyway. The later the silence got, the higher the camera rate went. 
Um, but by this one, and indeed, I think really by the, to a lesser extent, we fall down, but certainly by the time of, uh, even, even liberty is, a, is, a, is visibly somewhat undercranked, at least in places. This one, they, it looks like they, they were shooting at 24, expecting uh, to project at 24, which it was done because of the soundtrack. Um, so they, they, they'd gone for the accepted uh, sound film camera speed by then. Yeah, which suggests that yes, they were looking at that, and the way most of the dialogue scenes are shot, the conversation early on where they hear about the robbery, when the millionaire takes the call earlier on, mm. that's handled like a talkie. Yeah, it has the look of a talking sequence, even though it wasn't one. And I mentioned earlier on the two, the two shot, the two, the close, the close in scene with Lauren Hardy talking. It looks like a, a mute copy of a talkie. And so, yeah, I think that they were they would they were adapting already to what they knew they'd need to be doing with talking pictures. So this this does make it a an, a rather important a rather important transitional film, I think. And, and it's more in evidence here than it is in the well, say that's my wife, which um, was shortly thereafter. But it progresses further when you get as far as Double Whoopie. And anybody who's seen the the dubbed sound version of that, which works, yes. it works perfectly. It really does. I mean, I, I don't really approve of, of messing around with silence in that way necessarily. A bit of a purist, but but I, I I applaud its success technically, and it really does look like it could have been shot as a talkie. Yeah, yeah. And I think wrong again was the, probably, the, probably the beginning of that direction within which we did, did continue. It's it's not it's not true of, of um, big business. No, exactly. No, that is a pure silent. Yeah. So, yeah. but I think what they were doing was trying it out, seeing what they could do, uh, or what they would need to do, at least for some of the films they were doing, just not necessarily all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I've been I've been sort of charting the. Um, um, <clears throat> the sort of decision, if you like, to t- for, that Roach took to take the studio into the talkies, because leading up to this, there was a real kind of you, you could see the backwards and forwards in his mind. This is I'm, I'm going to talk you through the, the interviews that he's given to trade papers through the through the you know the the, the run up to this period, um, and it, it, he starts off kind of saying, "No, there's there's no room for for dialogue in silent com- in, in comedies in, in two reelers." Uh, for a feature film, it's it's probably fine, but actually for two reelers, there's no, you know, you, you've got to hold the laughs and it's going to spoil the film. The, it's mm-hmm. going to turn the audience, and then you can gradually see he's starting to he realizes that it's 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 not going to go away. This is coming, mm-hmm. um, and I think right at this point, uh, just as just as wrong again is starting to film, they're starting to shoot the film, um, is just when um, some of the engineers from Camden. Uh, from Victor are actually arriving at the studios, so it is right on that point where they're probably thinking, you know, let's do something where we can imagine having the dialogue in. You know, it really is, um, yeah. It's it's a it's a dialogue silent film. <laughs> you know, yes. But, uh, no, it's it's a fas- fascinating thing because I I really find it interesting how um, Roach's tone in in the in the interviews changes and he's very very unusually sort of hesitant when he's a, when he's asked questions about the silence and in that which is very unlike him he's mm. usually very you know forthright and he knows exactly what he's after he's very looking forward but this really sh- but as he did with you know everybody i guess it really shook him um, mm. and then as soon as he thought right i've made my mind up this is what we're doing suddenly it was right we're going to produce the best dialogue comedies and this that and the other it's just pure roach is fantastic yes uh, i think he I, I think that was that was him he he would have i think he had certain ideas in his head but recognized when something needed to be done and, yes. and having made that decision just went for it and did it better than anybody else would have done I mean, the, the, the Roach talking comedies are the best in the business. The, you see, you see some of them made at that time and for some time afterwards, and you just wince. You really, they really do. Some of them beg a belief. Um, there's no fluidity. There's nothing natural about them. There's not much to be funny about them. Um, they don't need to have the balance between talk and action, and uh, there's either too much of one or the other. 
and a, a general sort of an unnatural feel about them and, and, and yeah, a sense yeah. of strain and desperation. And yes. yeah, and you don't get that with the Roach product. You just don't get that. And that, I think, is ever, is, ever is the difference. And um, most of them had gone under by the middle 30s anyway, whereas Roach was still there. Yeah, this is true. Um, it was interesting as well. Um, Roach was saying, you know, the the, the equipment's on its way. It, we're we're going to have it turned around really quickly. I think December the fifteenth, and it'll all be done. Uh, and probably the f- the first um, product we're going to produce and release will be a Harry Langdon feature comedy oh. musical uh, with, yes. with singing beauties and this that and the other. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that that fell through. There was a f- there's a few newspapers that actually said Harry Langdon signed a contract with Roach to do these feature musical comedies and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And obviously that fell through, but then he did come back to do a series of talkies, didn't he? He did, uh, um, he did a pretty good series of talkie shorts. They're, most people hadn't seen them. Um, for years, you couldn't see them, or mm. hardly any of them are about. But um, but they're, they're about now, and if you see them as a body of work, they're not bad. Yeah. They're not bad. Yeah. Some of them, you know, some of them seem a bit slow and a bit clunky, but... Um, uh, the series overall is, is overall. Is, in, in any series, you find some oh, some yeah. bomb ones, don't you? Really? Well, yes, you do. <laughs> and uh, and if you just compare them again to what most other people are turning out at other studios in the short talking comedy category, then next to a lot of those, these are masterpieces. <laughs> and yeah, and Langdon found himself very very comfortably at Hal Roach because it was pretty much. Um, his silent film character in talkies, which he really didn't manage to pull off anywhere else. Um, he functioned, yeah. he functioned in enough talkies later on, made made loads, but you don't really see the pristine silent Langdon character in those as a rule. They're they're compromised yeah. to a greater or lesser degree. Whereas this is the Harry Langdon of the twenties, but in sound, and it. Does work. It could work. It works. Yeah. yeah. At Road Studios, it worked. And I think you can get them on uh, DVD now, can't you? The Langdon's. Yes. I'm, I'm sure they've. Uh, yeah, they've been. They've come out. I remember yeah. seeing the. Tra- they, they made like a short trailer for them, didn't they? Like a, a promo. Yeah, it was for, with Thelma Todd. Just for the just for the trade. Yeah, yeah, it was done just for exhibitors. It was wasn't intended for public release, but it was an in joke for a trade gathering oh. in New York, and hence uh, Thelma Todd being Mrs. Quimby. No, that's right. Yeah. Yes, of course. Now, the, yeah. the name Fred Quimby, if it means anything to anybody these days, it's as the credited producer for the good Tom and Jerry cartoons. Yeah, the good ones. Uh, yeah. And pe- <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And people have this idea that he was the man who made the good ones and they were no good after Quimby had gone because it's, it's, it's such a cuddly sounding name, Fred yes. Quimby. No, he was. he got that job as the nominal head of the cartoon unit really to coast him into retirement at MGM. He was a kind of long service metal. Um, but he'd been head of MGM's publicity in New York for years. And yeah. say so he got the cartoon gig at the end just to give him something easy to do before he retired. But as of that that trailer in 1929, he was still the head of that department that that film was designed to be shown to. And oh, right. so all that stuff about uh, her being Mrs. Quimby and how, uh, how all the little Quimby's, <laughs> that was all a huge joke at Fred Quimby's expense. <laughs> Well, 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 my goodness, how are you? Why, I'm very well, thank you. You're very well, huh? Yes. And well, 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 how am I? I'm you. Are you, are you, are you Miss Quimby? Yes. Well, you're Mrs. Quimby, huh? Yes. Mrs. Rogers. No. No, no, you, you, you're Mrs. Quimby. Yes. Have you, have you, have you got any little Quimby's? No. Oh, you haven't got any Quimby's? No. Not one, not one little Quimby? Not one. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's great. So, um, but no, not intended for public exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's a lovely little it's, piece. It's a lovely, lovely clip, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I'm sure Thelma Todd sort of bursts out laughing at one point. Well, she's she's certainly stifling the laugh. Oh yes, because uh, he's, he's he just seems to be ad libbing it, doesn't he? He's kind of riffing off it. It's really good. Yes, it, it's, it's all this all this uh, stream of unconsciousness rambling. <laughs> yeah, that's right. and, and that's back to the point about him being the Langdon of the silence of the twenties. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, there's no track, but you can see throughout those he's doing all this rambling in the silence. Yeah. 
<laughs> but in, in the Roach films, you could hear him doing it, and we don't get that in yeah. the rest of his talkies. This is yeah. the pure rambling Langdon. That's it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> think of rambling. We've done, done a lot of that. <laughs> We've done. It's the, it's the way to go. It's the way I mean, to go. There's st- um, still some bits that, that, that I, I didn't get around to. I'm, I'm sure you have some as well. Oh, good. Um, good. Uh, well, I'm getting. I'm getting to the end of mine. Eh? I think I've probably done too much talking. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you crack on. Well, it, that, <laughs> yeah, this this may seem absurd. But it can't sound like it at all. But I do actually prepare for these things. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. Yeah, I, you know, I, I give this impression of an impromptu chaos, but no, I do, I, <laughs> I do actually take some trouble with these. And uh, I think I probably said all I really needed to be, need to say about the music. Um, yeah. um, although I, I think we owe Randy Scrutman a huge debt for telling us the name of that the other tune for the for the turned around statue. Uh, oh, so I, I didn't know what it was called, uh, but it did sound like something that you get in a parody of nineteenth-century melodrama, and it is apparently from that sort of background. And it's it's called right. it's a nineteenth-century song called "She's Bore to Be Pitied and Censured," <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they, and of course, they really had it, you know. But yeah, yeah, more, that's right. yeah, which is a lovely comment on this poor twist around. Either, yeah. <laughs> that's right. And actually, that 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 gag itself, I think, is brilliant and really. You know the way that the way that Ollie hides that uh, the posterior, yeah. let's say, well, with his jacket. It's just such a beautiful little yeah. piece. Well, of course, he starts off by putting his bare hand on the bare buttock, and he <laughs> yes. he realizes what he's doing. Oh, oh, and he wraps the jacket around. So isn't that yeah. affronting the affronting the statue's decency in this way as well as concealing it? Right. It means he's not actually touching it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nicely done. Really, really good. Such, such grace, and um... but I think that builds it builds that character of that sort of southern gentleman. You know, he couldn't possibly look at this <laughs> bare buttocks, as you put it, yeah. so nicely. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, but they make such, they, they do such a lot. I think this the, the way that I know we said it was in Dizzy Daddies as well. Um, but the way that Laurel and Hardy use that prop is just. Fantastic compared to the way that Finlayson and um, I think I can't remember the other guy's name, um, um, Tyler Brook. Tyler Brook. Tyler Brook. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's just yeah, just fabulous. The way that Stan reacts to it, yes, um, and McCary allows yeah, him to react to it and sits with it for ages. Brilliant. And say yes, he just yeah. just just holds and lets Stan do what he does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, you it's really you good. can watch the thought process in, in his head. It's marvelous. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. McCary knew when to. Let the pace slow down, as they did at Bob Lauren and Hardy. Um, and mm. yeah, yeah, Stan's brain is trying to work this one out. And yeah. It's all totally sh- yeah. puzzled and shocked and affronted by this. <laughs> That's right. Because I think that, that that whole sort of thing starts from uh, is it uh, their purple moment with the with the bill when it's the cigar coupons. Oh, and he realizes, and he's mm. like, oh. And he's thinking, and he's looking again. And I think that's the f- the first time we see it. And mm. It just develops and develops, and it's you can see McCary's hand throughout these films, uh, yeah. and he's such a massive part of the, those two characters. Is is um, you know we talk about people can't be uh, it can't be overstated. Leo McCary's influence on Laurel and Hardy is massive, isn't it? it yes, it cannot be underestimated. Thinking about you know, Stan's thought processes, and indeed Ollie's. Brings me to uh, a conservation point. Okay. Yeah. Um, now we we know that they did not take particularly good care of the materials, the film materials over the years. Yeah. Uh, they weren't very well maintained, and they sustained more damage and deterioration as time went on. And um, when Blackpool Films, who started to do prints of them on eight sixty millimeter in the fifties needed to go back to the materials to make new negatives because of course the, their, their negatives will wear out. They'd go back to the materials and I think there were times when they found that they'd got worse since they struck the last neg and that, that type of thing. And sometimes I think things may have disappeared <laughs> in the intervening years between their negatives. And the, uh, the connection with thinking is that for years now, Prince of Wrong Again have been missing an intertitle where Ollie says time out while i think oh, yeah okay. and there's a visible splice in the film and it's right. in in ages copy at least it's about 10 minutes and 30 seconds in um but you know 
after the title card, Ollie sort of puts his head down, puts his head in his forehead, or all this sort of thing, doing thinking gestures. Right, right. But, uh, is this on the piano? Yeah, this when he's by the, by piano? the piano. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but suddenly he's doing thinking gestures without actually having said anything because the intertitle has gone. <laughs> right. I have the fifties Blackhawk print with that intertitle in. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. It's very early Blackhawk. It's a standard A print which I picked up in second hand when I was sixteen, I think. Right. And the same time as a standard eight print of a chump at Oxford, the same day. But of course, we've got the same gag in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, this is such an early Blackhawk print. It doesn't have the introductory history list on it. They hadn't started doing them then. Um, it's just a, 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 a straightforward Blackhawk replacement main title card of a far different design from the one they had earlier. Right. And then straight into the first intertitle. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's got that subtitle, intertitle in it. And by the time we get to the sixties and later prints, that's gone. And right. when they they matched up the, the rediscovered disc track to it in the late seventies, I think about seventy nine, I think they did it. Um, they must have had to do a very small audio in it because it doesn't throw it out yeah. sync. I think they must have had a they must have made a small audio cut, which is to their credit imperceptible. It doesn't go out. And um, <coughs> long, long ago, I tried matching up the track to the that 50s black or print of mine. And to make it work, <laughs> I had to yeah, in, yeah, insert yeah. the spacing to to pause the, to pause oh, the right. track. And um, so, um, but perversely, later on, there was another small cut to it. And I can't remember what it is, but something throws the track out for a bit towards the end. And... Where are we now? It's it's say it is, it's at about seventeen minutes and thirty again on the AG copy, um, and it didn't go out when I matched it up to the fifties print. <laughs> so obviously, obviously, that it's got it. Whatever's missing, it's got that. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, from that point, the effects are slightly late. Uh, anything from a door buzzer to the what should be a crunch sound for the painting hitting Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of that, it matches up to Del Henderson tripping up outside. <laughs> so it looks like that's the sound of him tripping. It's not. It's the sound of the painting going crunch. <laughs> right, right. And right. they and they bring it back in with an, a very obvious audio edit when they they're playing a hot time in the old town tonight. When it comes to an end, it does so very abruptly as a cut, and they've made an audio cut to bring it back in. So the clump of Harry Bernard throwing the shotgun down is in sync. <laughs> now I don't know if the original track is this complete, but they. If they put the cut back, whatever it is, they need to get that back into sync. That bit of music that they cut out as it plays out does occur elsewhere in the track. So you could lift the ending from that and drop it in there and bring it back again if you need. You thought about oh, this, yes. haven't you? You thought Believe about this. Me. Believe me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it could be done if all the picture element was restored. Um, of course. Yeah. Which you never know. Somebody may do one of these days. I hope so. But certainly that inter fingers crossed. Yeah, but yeah. certainly that intertitle really should go back in. Um, Definitely. And I, yeah. I, I can't believe I'm the only one who's got it, and I can't believe it's only on standard eight. Well, at least at least we know someone who has. Yeah. Well, and you're on record. Yeah. Now. And uh, <laughs> now there've got to be some early Blackhawk sixty mil prints of it out there. Yeah, that's yeah, true. So, yeah, that's a good point. So if anybody is ever going to do a restoration of it, I think they should be looking out for 60, but 50s rather, 60 mil black or prints on it. For those right. two bits. So uh, so any pending restorations, please take note. <laughs> this may be helpful. I hope so. I do hope so. To whom it may concern. To whom it may concern. Yeah, so where are we? Um... We were talking earlier, well, I was going on about Everson earlier on. Um William K. Everson made a comparison with the famous surrealist film Un Chien en mm. And he, he referred to uh, donkeys on a piano. Well, actually, it's, it's a guy hauling two pianos, each with a dead donkey on it. <laughs> I won't say drop the dead donkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, but suggested that he, he knew it was a long shot, but suggested that McCary or less likely Lauren and Hardy might have seen it and been influenced by it. But um, mm. but it really wasn't going to happen. McCary wasn't going to look at a European surrealist film, and Lauren and Hardy even less so. Good Lord, no. But but um, <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, Un Chien was first released in France in June 1929. 
months after Wrong Again was shot and released. Yes, yeah. Um, so who's to say that this surrealist lunacy of Dalian Boone Well might not have been, it might, it might have been just the reverse? Just Did, the reverse. Just the reverse? Did they see Wrong Again? <laughs> I mean, it's unlikely, given that that came out in February of 29 in the States, and that yeah. the, the time lag, being what it is, it's highly unlikely that they would have seen that by the time they were making Ocean mm. Anandalu, which I think was shot in 28 anyway. Right. But... Um, coincidence. Um, co- a total coincidence, but a very interesting one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It doesn't sound like very light viewing, though. A couple of dead donkeys being dragged around on a piano. Well, That's awful. well, it's not the worst thing in it. This is the one with the notorious ice slashing scene. Oh, my God. It's that. When you see that horror... I think they used it in Clockwork Orange, that horrible business where... Obviously, it's fake, but a girl supposedly had an eye, an eye slit open with a, with, a, with a razor. That is from the same film. Um, so, no, a couple of dead donkeys next to that. Well, in comparison. Oh, happy days. Happy days. <laughs> happy days. But... But yes. Well, this is the Halloween episode, so I think that's that's, that's about as ghoulish as we're going to get today. <laughs> <laughs> There must be more, but if we're lucky, there isn't. Um, I know. think I'm. Dry. I think my notes are dry. I think now, Glenn. I think we've. Um, I'm dry. As far as um, second to last filmed in 1928, and it was the second release of 1929. And yeah, actually, there is one more thing to be said about it. Thinking about it, though, and this is back to the diss tracks and the sync issue and so on. I sometimes wonder how the diss tracks they prepared could have synchronised with both the domestic and overseas versions. Because we know that from still from stills taken on the set of Wrong Again and others, they were still cranking two cameras simultaneously, one for domestic neg, one for overseas neg. And we've seen them as with the version different the two different versions of Big Business, two different versions of um, Double Whoopee, Yudan Tutan. Yeah. They're not a match. They don't match. And they were cranking. They I don't think they were being operated by clockwork or electricity, they were. I think they're still hand turning, even though the, the cameramen were that good that they knew they were cranking twenty four. They were that precise, right? But there were also slight variations in editing and and in action, little bits of business. And the two negs were never twins, but we do know that these these films were shown in Britain with the disc tracks. Um, I've got a, I've, I've got a billing from a. Uh, I was at the Empire Cinema in London um, for Habeas Corpus, and it's billed as a Hal Roach synchronised comedy. Okay. Yep, so they were, they were showing them with the diss tracks in this country, but it would have been the overseas negative. So, yeah, of course. So I do wonder, really, how how they managed this. I mean, they, they must have made good and sure there were no variants between the content of them, and the editing must have been done to provide an exact match which they didn't have to do for a purely silent release. But I think they, they must have uh, used, yes, two legs, but precisely cut at the same point. They had to have done it that way. Otherwise, I can't see it working. No, as you say, it would have been, yeah, it would have just made a mockery of the synchronisation. Yeah, um, and it's something that I don't think has been addressed as a topic, so... Uh, no, that's a good point. Yeah, and, um, and we don't have the luxury of two versions of too many of the Laurel and Hardys. Yeah. And um, say so no 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 uh, alternate version of wrong again to make that comparison in this instance. I don't think there's another that's my wife either. But yes, it's said if we if we did have the luxury of an alternate UK, US, you know, twin versions of young of uh, That's My Wife, we might get that back again. But we like but from what I can see of it, we're lucky to have the one. <laughs> with, with Definitely. The, I think that's yeah, we can always come back to the fact that we are very lucky to have it at all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but of course it was a point you made much earlier. Um in that we're very fortunate in that so much of the of the Laurel and Hardy output does survive when you consider how much doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, we we, yeah, exactly. we are so lucky. Yeah, we grumble about hats off and, and parts of Battle of the Centuries, or a part of Battle of the Centuries still, but and Rogue Song. But um, by and large, Laurel and Hardy <laughs> have have fared very well, unusually well. Yeah. Yeah, given the losses, oh, exactly. in, yeah, given the losses in silent cinema, and so probably talking cinema elsewhere, they yeah. they've done pretty well. Definitely, there's a lot of the, a lot of the outgang are still missing, I think, as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, from the MGM period, at least, to some of the pathies. 
I think. Yeah. But most of the losses were with the MGMs. Same with Charlie Chase. Mm. And the problem was that MGM worked anything out. Um, the Pathés, by and large, so I, all right, there's, there's a fair amount of 35 bill around on them. But by and large, the, the Pathés have come down to us because Pathé were well into the home movie market libraries and, and sales and so they would they would put them on 16 mil 9.5 8 mil later on but mostly 16 and 95 and that's why they've tended to stay around mgm were not interested in night licensing for the home movie market and they kept a very very tight rein on release prints yeah they were very strict path there i think it was somewhat more casual attitude but mgm exchanges were very, very careful about getting the prints returned once they'd had their run. And once they'd had once they'd had their run, usually the prints were in pretty bad state, they were on the worn. And so they'd like likely not be junked. And if there's going to be any preservation material, it will be the camera negatives and maybe if you're lucky, a fine grain positive. So for duping purposes, duplicating purposes. But by and large, the prints did not get out. And so if anything happened to the negative, that's it, kaput. And that's why there were so many gaps in the MGM, how Roach comedies, rather than the pathways. Of course, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, that's what happened to so many of the Our Gang and Char Charlie Chase silence. And uh, I think if Blackhawk, if Blackhawk hadn't got in when they did, um, started making them available on 16, there would not necessarily be as many of them left today. No, it's uh, the whole Black Hawk thing is, is quite an education for me because I, I was, um, you know, too, I'm too young really to have been involved in any of the sort of collecting of Black Hawks. But every, you know, every guest that I talk about, it's all, yeah, the, the, it's all tipping the hat to Black Hawk films. Yes. Um, yes. So thank goodness, yeah, thank goodness they got involved when they did. Yeah, otherwise we'd have what Robert Youngson copied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and of course, there was times when he preserved things that Blackhawk were too late for. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Somebody was telling me once um, about, you know, a good, a, a, well, a potentially good source of of films is Australia. Oh, where yeah. it reached the end of the, you know, of the sort of distribution chain. Yes, that's where it just, you know, they just ended up and were left there. So, yes, you know. that's that's why the last. The last missing Ted Helian Studios short turned up in Australia. Oh, right, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, Hello Pop, I think it was. Right. And that was the one that was always missing. It's two strip Technicolor. And right. I, the negative went up in the MGM vault fire of the mid 60s, I think, along with the rest of them. Um, but there were copies around of all of the other ones. Um, but that was the last one that was missing, and it turned up in Australia, where, as you say, it was at the end of the M MGM distribution chain. Yeah. And it's got left yeah. there. Yeah. So they came back. Well, it's not in bad shape either, thankfully. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it's yes. always turned to hats off again. You see, it's always the, it always comes back to hats off. There's, yes. There may be hope somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I. You know. Let let, let us comb Alice Springs. Um, <laughs> oh, we should perhaps go ourselves and uh, do it manually. That'd be nice. Or <laughs> well, once a year. <laughs> Once a year, yeah, yeah, over the winter. Let's do that. That's... <laughs> well, sounds good to me. That sounds good to me. Uh, brilliant. Well, Glenn, as I say, I've, I have nothing left. I don't know if you've got any any more gems for us. It's been oh, no, fantastic think... um, chatting through wrong again today. I've enjoyed it myself. No, I, I think I've exhausted all the the, the chronicled random thoughts that constitute my notes. <laughs> 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 no, I think that's probably it. I'm looking through it, thinking there must be something that slipped up. Oh yeah, actually, a couple of odds, odds and ends. This is really in the postscript department. But again, Randy's pointed this up, but it's something that most people don't get these days. And it's the uh, the horse anchor joke. Oh yes, yeah. yes. And of course, they do use one in going bye bye. They use an actual horse anchor. Their car won't move because Stan's throwing the horse anchor, which you wouldn't use for a car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's obviously using it as, dis as, a, as a dissuasion tactic from the car being stolen, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> as if it's going to make any difference. But it's also yeah, this, exactly. this relatively small weight is enough to stop their rather worn out car from going anywhere. There's obviously no <laughs> guts left in the engine. But of course, in wrong again, it's a visual comparison joke. It's the lid of the urn he uses instead of 
of a horse anchor. It, it, right. Even though it's quite insubstantial, it wouldn't make any difference. It just looks enough like a horse anchor. And he seems very satisfied. So it gives the horse yeah. a nod as if to say, right, you know, try and go somewhere down. <laughs> yeah, he just but, slings it on the floor. Yeah. yeah, but people don't know them now because um, we don't see much in the way of horses by, by everyday traders. Whereas in those days, there were loads of businesses that still used a horse for traveling around from house to house. And you couldn't always tie the horse up. There wasn't always somewhere too tied up. And of course it was mm. time consuming. Yeah. Um, whereas that was a quick, easy way of stopping the horse from straying. Of course. An everyday thing of the period, which we don't see now. And a lot of people wouldn't necessarily get that gag as round his point. No, out. you're right there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, you can kind of, you can kind of tell what he's doing, but it, yeah, that the sort of reasoning behind it, it mm. just, it just, just, Passes us by, I guess. Yeah, it's true. That is. Yeah. Well, when I first saw that, um, I, I I I got it in a, in in a sense in that it was very obvious that this was something totally insubstantial. That was not that was not going to stop yeah. the horse from going anywhere. I didn't make the comparisons of the horse anchor at that time. I admit, but um, right. by the time I was sixteen, we didn't get a lot of tradesmen door to door using horses. No, no, exactly. The occasional the occasional incomprehensible rag and bone man coming past. <laughs> and they remain incomprehensible to this day. Oh, it's it's, it's part of the rules, absolutely. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that was just this minor detail that appealed to me. And uh, there was um, also actually talking about whether or not there was a racehorse, actual racehorse at the time called Blue Boy, oh, yeah. and I found no trace of them. But um, they uh, they did actually make a reference to another famous racehorse of the 20s, though, Man of War. And I think Men of War was a play on that. All right, OK. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, one of those people at Film Classics turned it into, but Man of War, on their misspelt title card. <laughs> when they reissued it, it was reissued as Man of War. Right. But, right uh, that was just, a, just a, you know, a mistranscribed card. But, uh, but no, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that, that Men of War, apart from the, the, uh, the maritime connotations of the expression, I do think it might have been a sort of semi-topical nod to the race or man of war. Well, we know they they did like uh, a gamble on the races. Certainly, Babe did. <laughs> yes, oh, certainly. So yes, he probably would have been very familiar with the uh, the horses and and uh, Roach as well. I think it was. Roach. Uh, yep. Yeah, he was familiar. Yeah. He was he was a race a race guy and uh, a, a, a horse owner, I believe. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, he rode horses. Yeah, didn't he? yeah, of course. Yeah, he did. yeah, did the whole thing, and, and Babe Hardy was heavy into it. Dropped a lot of money, and. Um, yeah. And his bit in uh, Riding High for Frank Capra, he's this luckless racetrack gambler. And he's, yeah. he's supposed to have said something to Capra at the time of, when the scene was described to him, saying he's supposed to have said something like, this This does sound rather like this this unfortunate Southern gentleman or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some, something like that, reflecting his own his own rather serious gambling losses on the horses. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. It's a nice cameo, that is, actually, yeah. in, that, uh, in that film. It's rather lovely, yes. Rather lovely. Brilliant. Well, I think that's well, exhausted. I think we've drained it dry. Yes, <laughs> dry, dry as that horse by the fish tank. That's right. You, you, we need right. the tune. We need the tune. How I am. We need it. <laughs> or we'll just throw horses in. Yeah. We like, just like the name. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> not, well, not so much a name as a label. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, Glenn, no, thank you so much for joining us again today, Glenn. It's been, it's been brilliant, as always, no, to, to chat with you. I've really enjoyed great, it, Great, thanks. great films. That's no, lovely. And, and hopefully it won't be too long before we get you back on again. Yes, yes, be happy to do it. Um, yes, uh, give, me, give me the proverbial shout. And uh, how, how, many, how many films later, do you think? It <laughs> won't be many. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it will be many. Too early to tell. I'm sure, uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll. I'm sure we can squeeze another silent one in yet before we get into the talkies. There are some left, yes. <clears throat> yeah, we've got. I think there's five silents left. I can't believe we're actually that far down the line now. Mm. It doesn't seem two minutes since we started on Lucky Dog, and uh, and here we are, all, almost into the talkies. So yeah. it's uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff still to come there, which is brilliant. So yeah, ben, thank you so much. It's been a, an absolute blast as always. And uh, mm. yeah, well, you take care, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, see you too, Patrick. Take care, and uh, yes, yeah, speak to you relatively soon. <laughs> Uh, it's always a treat to chat with Glenn. Uh, he's such a nice guy and so full of knowledge. Um, and Glenn is just one of my podcast guests who is contributing to my new book, Laurel and Hardy Silence. Uh, it really is a wonderful project of collaboration of film historians, experts and collectors from around the world. And I can't wait to get it into your hands. 
Now, don't forget, if you're interested in getting more information about publication dates and how you can secure your copy, the best way to stay up to date is to join my free mailing list. Just click the link in the podcast show notes or visit laurelandhardyblog.com. You can also find links in the show notes to all of my blogs or essays on the boys' films. Also, links to purchase CDs of the Bohunks music, copies of books written by my esteemed guests, and the Laurel and Hardy magazine, and much more besides. So, huge thanks to our good friend, Glenn Mitchell. Thank you to the Bohunks Orchestra for the gorgeous music. And above all, thank you to you for listening and keeping this podcast going. Please do stay in touch. I love to hear from you. Uh, you can send your emails and voice messages to laurelandhardyblog at gmail.com. And who knows, you may even make it onto one of the shows. And so, all that's left to say is goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And a very goodbye from me. Goodbye. Thank you.